Hello everyone, this is Nitpicky Nerd and I just watched the third episode of the Pike show called Ghosts of Illyria and in my opinion it wasn't a bad episode but I have the sense, I have the bad feeling that this show is starting to go off the rails a little bit and that it might become another STD in the near future. And the main problem is once again with the writing. I think visually this show is much better than Discovery and Lightyear is better than Picard and all the actors are great. There's a lot of good stuff in here so I'm not looking for things to hate in it but I once again have a whole list of nitpicks. So the episode begins with the crew going to some alien planet to figure out why the inhabitants disappeared and the planet is being attacked by a cloud which is once again one of those uh, things which annoyed me in Discovery that there are always clouds in space and in all the track shows there are always space phenomenons and stuff like that but it wasn't so simplistic as just a, a lightning storm in space and a cloud in space. I mean, sometimes it was, but usually it was some kind of nebula, it was some kind of exotic matter, there was some kind of explanation that would make sense in a science fiction way. But yet in Discovery, we always saw clouds in space as if the sky is in space, meaning normal clouds as they look like on Earth, that's how they look like in space and the ship flies among them. I don't have a problem when a distant nebula looks like a cloud from a distance, that's fine, but the way it actually looks like the size of an earth cloud and yet it's in space where there is no air, stuff like that annoys me a little bit. I don't mind, I understand that it's done just for visual fun and so I'm willing to forgive stuff like that but I still have the urge to mention it and then not just with this ion storm with the planet but even later on in a different part of space we also see clouds and so obviously it's part of that whole exaggerated style that everything has to be beautiful even out in space when there's supposed to be nothing most of the time and yet always there are clouds and so they go to this planet which is attacked by an ion storm and they say that the planet is regularly visited by this ion storm and yet they go there anyway and we see that the buildings are still intact, the windows are still intact, and yet in this episode while they are hiding in it, suddenly then it breaks, even though that was, uh, they said it's a regular storm that always hits the planet, and yet only now it gets more powerful when they're in there, I guess. So little things like that which are convenient and don't really make sense, but I guess I would be willing to forgive it if there was an actual story on the planet, but I also have the feeling that the only reason that Pike and Spock got stuck on the planet was only done so that the women can be on command on the bridge because when we see the bridge it's only women there and they're doing everything by themselves and there was no real purpose to Pike and Spock being on the planet, there was no real story there. And that's my biggest problem with all of this, is that the writing is not clever, there is no reason. The only reason it was done so that uh, number one can be in charge of the Enterprise while Pike is stuck on the planet. There was no story with Pike on the planet. There was some dialogue, there were a few scenes of him, but nothing of substance, unfortunately. And they also say that the inhabitants of the planet, uh, the Illyrians or whatever they're called, were genetically engineering themselves, and that's against Federation law, and that's why they were not accepted into the Federation, and that they all disappeared for some reason. And it's not really clear if those people were humans who settled on the planet, or were they complete aliens, it's kind of vague, and I think there was a species which were named the same back in Enterprise, uh, that was the species which uh, Archer stole their engine from, because he needed it for his urgent mission to save Earth from the Zindi, and so he stranded a ship of those aliens out in space, and never bothered to visit them later to give it back to them, they were never mentioned again, which is funny, that was uh, another missed opportunity of Enterprise. And those aliens had strange foreheads and yet uh, when we see snapshots of uh, the aliens in this episode they look totally human except the ones which got augmented with webbed fingers or strange eyes or ears and whatever. So maybe those people we saw in Enterprise were specifically adapted to a different planet and that's why they look different with the strange forehead. So, or maybe it's not the same people at all, maybe it's simply the same name. But that again implies bad writing because why would you pick the same name which was used before? Why wouldn't you check it before you write it? And so if it was not intended to be the same aliens, so why did you call it that? And also it's too similar sounding to the El Orians, which is Guinan species. So that will only add to the confusion of people who just casually watch it, who just finished watching Picard and heard about El Orians and suddenly they hear a similar name here. And so this is just unnecessarily confusing writing. So why not make it clear? if the aliens are humans or not, or are they complete aliens. So anyway, because they genetically engineered themselves, they're not allowed to join the Federation, 
And that does fit what was mentioned in Deep Space Nine, that genetically augmented people are not allowed into Starfleet. They never said they're not allowed to live in the Federation or stuff like that, only they're not allowed into Starfleet specifically. And that by itself was kind of a continuity contradiction with an episode of TNG in which they visited the Darwin station on the planet Gagarin 4 in which they were doing all-out genetic engineering and creating augmented children with magic powers and stuff like that. And no one ever said in that whole episode that the thing they were doing was illegal. Picard did imply something immoral about that, but no one ever said that they were committing a felony and they were said to be a Federation research facility. And there was another episode of TNG called the Masterpiece Society about an Earth colony from 200 years ago with humans who were also kind of genetically engineering themselves. But yet they never mentioned the fact that it's illegal in the Federation. And in the end of that episode, they actually took some of the people from that colony to the Federation and no one ever told them you will not be allowed to be in Starfleet or stuff like that. They seem to be totally fine to come to the Federation and no one ever said anything bad will happen to them. And so there are continuity issues even between TNG and Deep Space Nine in which suddenly even O'Brien himself said to Bashir there was not a case like this for a century of discovering someone who is augmented and so we won't know what the Federation will do to you and so on. And so definitely a continuity issue and yet this show chose to follow Deep Space Nine's canon and not so much TNG's and also I'm not even sure I agree with Deep Space Nine's idea that it should be outlawed in the Federation. I guess they never said the characters are against that only that the system is, the government is and so it's not necessarily saying that it's a bad thing to do but still that's the implication because the Federation is always described as the perfect society, the utopia and all of that and yet it has all these restrictions which I'm not sure I agree with morally. Why shouldn't humans try to improve themselves and cure all diseases and stuff like that? Of course there are dangers and all of that and uh, you know science fiction always dealt with the dangers of you know good intentions accidentally creating uh, disasters and monsters and stuff like that. That's fine to do in episodes but uh, this whole idea that the Federation simply outlaws it completely because of something that happened centuries ago with primitive genetic engineering, this whole idea is kind of silly in my opinion. And it would have been better simply not to mention that issue. Just deal with alien cultures and what aliens do and then Federation laws don't really apply to them and then you can do different kinds of stories with that idea. So the fact that they trying to tie it to Deep Space Nine, I'm not sure is even a good idea. The only good thing about that idea was that it explains why aren't all humans augmented in Star Trek? Why aren't all the people we see are perfect? Which would be a bad idea for a show because, you know, watching a show about a bunch of superhumans who can do anything and they don't age and they don't get sick and so on that would be kind of boring probably so that was a neat excuse to explain why the people in the far future are not genetically engineered because it was outlawed for some philosophical reason and so on so that's uh, the same kind of excuse as why Starfleet doesn't use clocking devices even though everyone else seemed to have them and yet Starfleet who are so scientific apparently can't clock their ships and so that's why they explained it in an episode that it was because of some charity they had with the Romulans, that's why cloaking devices were illegal in the Federation, so that was also kind of silly because why would you limit yourself in that way, but at least it explains that problem of why don't Starfleet ships have that, and so that again makes it less overpowered for your ship to not have all the possible abilities and all of that, so I understand why those older shows wanted to explain those questions away, on the other hand it creates all these other problems now. And now that uh, this show is stuck between the different continuities uh, with the different shows, then it creates another problem. And if the writers were clever, maybe they would try to somehow explain away the previous contradictions to say maybe there will be some exception made for a specific colony in which genetic research will be allowed. But just on that one colony, maybe some exception that the Federation Council would give it and so on. So if the writing was clever, they could have explained that away, maybe different jurisdictions in different sectors of the Federation or whatever, maybe in some part, because of the wishes of different uh, members of the Federation, the laws would be different. And yet, according to this new show, no, the entire Federation is against genetic engineering just because one member planet had eugenics wars on their own planet and somehow the same fear now rules the whole federation and no one is allowed to do genetic engineering anymore. So I think what they're doing in this show is making an already messy situation worse by adding all these new details and even character wise it now brings up new questions. Like we have this character of Nunian Singh, the great granddaughter of Khan 
serving on the ship which is a huge continuity issue how come no one ever heard the name Nunian Singh when he first came on the ship in Space Seed and uh, it took Spock some research and only then he figured out who that guy even was no one remembered him from the history books I guess he wasn't using his uh, real name when he was ruling Earth back in the 90s or something so it took Spock some research to figure out he was the guy who was rumored to have been the ruler of Earth for a while and so on and yet now apparently there was a crew member with the same name serving on the same ship for years and yet no one made that connection in TOS and in the show everyone knows all about it and she herself knows all about it and it also brings the question if she's the descended of a genetically augmented person then why is she allowed in Starfleet if that's forbidden is that kind of a loophole to get genetically augmented people allowed because if uh, your parents genetically engineered themselves and then gave birth to you and they passed down their superior genes to you and yet because you yourself were not the one who was augmented directly that means you're okay you're allowed so that doesn't really make sense if that person still has an unfair advantage because his parents genes got improved and why is that person still allowed in Starfleet so it doesn't really make sense when you start to think about all these issues how does Starfleet decide who is allowed in or not? If genetic superiority is outlawed, then why is she allowed? And also in this episode, it turns out another character is also genetically engineered, which I did not see coming because that was a pre-established character who was always uh, thought to be a normal human. And yet suddenly turned out to be augmented as well and even much more powerful than Khan's granddaughter for some reason. So it was just so weird. And that whole revelation about number one being augmented and possibly an alien, even though it's unclear if those people were actually aliens or not. Did no one ever scan her DNA when she was in Starfleet? Like only now it's revealed and it came so out of the blue. It was a complete surprise. There was no setup to it, except all those scenes in which she was shown to be physically superior to men, which I just assumed is just part of the philosophy of these new shows that women are always more powerful and more clever than men and all of that. So I was just about to make fun of all those scenes of number one uh, being so bigger and stronger than all the men around her and there was even a scene of her picking someone up putting him on her shoulder and walking with him with ease as if he's a rag doll and he actually he looks like he is actually a rag doll in that shot of her carrying him so i was actually about to laugh at that part uh, a lot but then later in the episode they revealed she is actually augmented herself and she was hiding it she went into starfleet under false pretenses and no one knew she's augmented until now and uh, she tells Pike in the end of the episode and then he just says he will keep it secret from Starfleet so you know Pike who was shown to be such a scout boy in season 2 of Discovery that he always follows the rules and he's so honest and all of that now they're already ruining his character by showing that actually he's doing whatever he wants and he doesn't listen to Starfleet he doesn't follow the Federation law and all of that and so it starts to kind of eat away at his character as well at his integrity and all of that so that's another problem in this episode and I guess by the end of the show her character will be exposed and she will no longer be in Starfleet and whatever I guess they'll do there is the potential to do some interesting stories with that idea but it just came out of nowhere and it's just so weird the way they did it and the way that she is apparently much stronger than Nunian Singh's character who I thought is going to turn out to be augmented because of her last name and so obviously she is going to turn out to be super strong or something she will be like Alara in the Orville with special abilities but now apparently she's a normal human and it's number one who is the augmented one so that was uh, really strange in my opinion and also Khan's granddaughter keeps crying about her sad childhood that uh, kids were poking fun at her because of her last name and calling her an augment and a monster and I keep thinking why didn't you simply change your last name why did you keep it it's like uh, someone today would keep the last name Hitler and insist on using it everywhere and then be surprised when people look at you strangely like it doesn't really make sense and so things like that little details like that are starting to pile up and uh, make me worried about the future of the show which I'm sensing might go off the rails in the very near future much sooner than I expected and we have another sob story another tragic backstory of a character when uh, the ship's doctor reveals that his daughter is terminally ill she only has weeks to live and that's why he secretly keeps her 
inside the transporter pattern and keeps recycling her in the pattern which is another continuity issue because isn't Scotty the first one to ever invent it because you know Riker and Jordi were surprised that that was even possible and I could buy that in TNG because Scotty was a genius you know he knew about transporters more than anyone so he invented some genius way to keep himself stored in the transporter for decades and everyone else was so surprised by that and yet apparently it's now a common practice, like anyone can do it. Even this doctor who is not even an engineer, he was able to store his daughter in the transporter and kept it secret from everyone because he is hoping to find a cure for his daughter. Why didn't he simply put her in a normal stasis field, in a normal suspended animation? Why the need to do this risky, untested way to store her in the transporter which no one ever heard about until Scotty invented it and yet this doctor did it decades before him apparently. And you know, Scotty also did it with a friend of his who did not survive, so that indicates the chances of survival is 50%, and yet this doctor is doing it on his own daughter and risking her life instead of simply freezing her. So what's the point of that? So I guess to keep her hidden, to bring her along on this mission, which he thought will not be allowed otherwise, and so... It's once again another tragic backstory, so that by itself is funny, that was funny to me when he started telling that, and also it's similar to that scene in Into Darkness, with the guy whose daughter was ill, and I mentioned previously how this show is also very similar to the JJ movies, and so once again implying the same mindset or the same people working on the show as on those movies, and so stuff like that makes me really worried and also the unoriginality of it, especially all those scenes of people starting to get attracted to light uh, because they got infected by something from the planet and suddenly many people on the ship are drawn to sources of light and they want to expose themselves to light and that immediately made me think of the movie Sunshine 2007 which was about people on a starship heading to the sun and some people on the ship starting to get strange attraction to the sun and wanting to look at the sun and expose themselves to the sun all the time. And we had some really similar scenes in this episode. And I'm not even sure what exactly was their explanation. They said something about vitamin D deficiency causing this attraction to want to expose yourself to light, which doesn't really make sense because it doesn't work like that and especially with that Andorian, that pale Andorian who comes from an ice planet and that's why he's blind because it's a dark planet and yet he's attracted to light because he has a vitamin D deficiency that doesn't make any sense and then he beams up a chunk of lava from the planet's core into the transporter room to heat himself up so wait so is he attracted to heat? or to sunlight. Either way, it doesn't fit his species because he comes from a frozen planet, so he's the last person who should be affected by this phenomenon. Like, he should have been the one who is not affected because he comes from a frozen planet and he's blind and shouldn't be attracted to heat sources if his uh, environment is supposed to be cold. Also, this scene reminds me of something I suggested when I was watching Star Trek Picard when there was the whole thing with the ship that was crashed in France and yet they were able to beam people to LA, which indicates their transporter can beam people and things uh, through the entire planet and yet in one episode Jurati was freezing and couldn't heat herself up and I said why don't you just beam a chunk of lava from the middle of the planet into one of the rooms in the ship and that way you will heat up the whole ship without any problems and yet no one ever thought of that and yet in this show that's what they're doing and then number one has to stun him to prevent him from killing himself that way and then she just carries him on her shoulder and then walks in slow motion in the corridor and that I think was the part when I started face palming and realizing this is another STD. At least they explained later that she's super powerful because she's augmented. It's not just because she's a woman and he's a man. And there were other scenes in this episode of other men on the ship being all puny and small and stupid and they, when they were on the planet there was a, an ensign who looked kind of like Loki who was behaving stupidly and he was the first one to get infected and when he came to the ship he started looking at the lights and then he punches his head uh, through glass to get closer to the lamp and I keep thinking, wait, why is there again glass on the ship? Isn't it supposed to be transparent aluminum? Why is he so easily knocking his head through glass? And there were other scenes in the episode which showed men who look physically smaller than the women in the same shot and stuff like that which made me remember a quote from the TNG episode Angel 1 when Picard was describing a planet ruled by women and he said that the women on that planet are much bigger and stronger than the men and that's perfectly natural for that planet and yet that's how it is 
in STD and in this show apparently because the women seem to be physically bigger and stronger than men and men are always shown to be stupid and we have the Asian transporter guy whose name Kyle which is the same name as a guy who was in TOS who was not Asian and maybe it's a different guy who just happens to have the same name I guess it's possible but the funny thing about him is how small he is next to number one when they are together in the same shot it's as if it's a mother and her child standing together and then we have scenes on the bridge with only women on the bridge not a single man because Pike and Spock are stuck on the planet for the whole episode and they barely do anything we have a few scenes of them talking about what might have happened on the planet and that's it there is no real substance of anything happening to them there is no importance to their story on the planet at all and it's all about number one going around the ship trying to fix everything because everyone gets sick with that disease wanting to get closer to the light and we have a lot of scenes really similar to the movie sunshine i don't think it's a coincidence and it was annoying how number one also had the symptoms but she was hiding it and that annoyed me it reminds me of a lot of episodes like that when one character had something wrong but didn't want to admit it at least they kind of explained that later on as well because they said that she is actually immune to the mental effects of it because she is from that same people who got augmented and that also explains why she was hiding it and so at least some of the issues I had with the episode as I was watching it were kind of explained later on and so maybe on second viewing it wouldn't be as annoying. There were some things I did like, for example Uhura's quarters, it was shown that she is actually sharing quarters with other cadets, she doesn't have her own giant quarters and they do sleep in those small bunk beds that each one has his own bunk, which uh, fits with what we saw in some of the TOS movies and also in Lower Decks and also in the episode Lower Decks in TNG when they said that uh, Ensigns share quarters, they don't have their own quarters until they become lieutenants and so at least it fits that and uh, that's something I was going to complain about when they show the huge quarters that people have in the show which contradicts something that Scotty said when he was on the Enterprise D and was given quarters and said that those quarters on TNG are huge that in his time even an admiral wouldn't get that kind of big room on a starship and so that is a continuity issue with the sizes of the rooms we see in STD and in this show but at least when they show the cadets they are shown to have smaller quarters with small bunk beds for each of them and so that is a small detail which I did appreciate even though that's a continuity issue with the show itself because when we saw the turbolift shaft in one of the short tracks it also looked like a city size void with a bunch of turbo lifts going everywhere with huge spaces between them and so if they have so much room inside the ship then why can't they have bigger quarters even for cadets and also how come those cadets have holograms inside their quarters because didn't they say in season 2 of discovery that the enterprise's holographic system malfunctioned and that they're completely removing all the holograms from the enterprise forever which they only said that i guess to explain away the continuity question of how come kirk never used holograms to communicate with other ships and other people he always used the view screen and so they tried to explain that away in discovery by saying that oh it's just malfunctioned forever and they will never again have holograms in the enterprise and yet in this episode they do use holograms inside one of the rooms i guess maybe it was a port portable device which wasn't connected to the ship systems. I guess we can always come up with excuses but again it shows the lack of attention to detail in their own writing. Why couldn't they simply keep things consistent at least inside of their own show? We could explain the differences with the other show by saying it's a different timeline or whatever but when they have continuity contradictions inside their own show that becomes even bigger problem in my opinion. So anyway, number one is also attracted to light, but she is able to control it, which again kind of annoyed me early on before I knew she's augmented. I thought, oh, is she so strong-willed that she's simply able to resist her urges, unlike all the other men on the ship, that only she is able to resist it. And also her skin starts glowing, like that effect that we saw in uh, Iron Man 3, when some people turn themselves into mutants or something and had those kind of uh, glowing skin. And I think we saw that in Star Trek Discovery as well, when we had that Vulcan who wanted to blow himself up and he also started glowing from inside and stuff like that. So anyway, number one is able to hold it together and she figures out that the disease spreads by light itself and so they turn off all the lights on the ship and I thought that is going to be a neat part of the episode that uh, everything will be in total darkness and maybe they'll make us see everyone somehow and we'll see how people handle being blind inside the ship but they didn't do that even we don't actually see anything like they said they sedated most of the crew 
and we don't actually see anyone going around in the dark or something. They, it just looks slightly less lit than before, but no real big difference. And so a bunch of missed opportunities as well. And then we see Khan's granddaughter in engineering planning to blow up the warp core to get the radiation because she's so eager to get exposed to the light and all of that stuff. And then number one comes to stop her and then they fist fight against each other and number one is much stronger because she is the real augment and not Noonien Singh who turns out to be normal and so then she cries about kids making fun of her when she was a kid and calling her a monster and all of that so why didn't you just change your name then? And meanwhile Spock and Pike are still on the planet and they're hiding away from the storm and then they see ghosts flying around outside, some energy creatures flying around and they discuss where they came from and then Spock speculates maybe the people of the planet actually turned into those energy beings and we don't actually know if that's the case or not, it's never really explained, it's not uh, continued, they just leave the planet in the end and we don't actually know what the hell happened there. So I guess the people on the planet all turned into ghosts and then they think the ghosts are trying to break in into the room and so they block the door and then they get in anyway through the window and then the storm is going to kill them and then the energy creatures apparently shield them and protect them because they're actually good and so they save Spoken Pike and then they leave and so that's basically it. All of this also reminds me of a scene in season 2 of Discovery when Pike actually said that he doesn't like ghosts because uh, that was the reason he didn't like uh, using the holographic communications because the people who appeared as holograms looked kind of like ghosts and he didn't like that and yet now he's been saved by a bunch of ghosts Anyway, I think it's probably just a coincidence, but uh, then in the end of the episode, when number one tells him the truth that she lied in her application to Starfleet and all of that, and then he agrees to keep it all a secret, because he says that she broke all the stigmas that the Federation has against augmented people, because she's actually so good, and maybe because those ghosts of the augmented people saved his life, maybe that's why he likes them now. And so, where are they going with all of this? I have no idea. If the writing was clever, I would have said maybe they could do follow-up episodes and show more colonies of those augmented people and they can do strange and interesting stuff with it. Maybe that's what they're planning. Maybe they will somehow explain in the end of this story arc that the Federation will give special dispensation for a specific planet of those people to join the Federation despite being genetically engineered. And maybe that could explain that planet we saw with the Darwin station in TNG in which apparently it was legal to do genetic experiments. They also said something silly that <laughs> those people, they wanted to join the Federation so badly that they were going to de-engineer themselves, which is a silly idea in itself. And didn't the crew of this ship change their own genomes to go to an alien planet just two episodes ago? Isn't that the whole idea of that hypospray changing you to look like an alien? I guess maybe it's that's just temporarily changing your uh, outward appearance and not permanently changing your DNA so it's not the same thing but again it raises all these questions of where exactly do we put the line so it is allowed to change your genes a little bit but not too much so if you're a descendant of someone who is genetically engineered then that is okay apparently because Nuni and Singh is serving in Starfleet with no problems and yet number one being augmented is a problem somehow and so nothing makes any sense if you actually analyze it and think about it and that's a problem. And that's what really worries me about the show, that the writing itself has all these logical problems and just as a story itself it's not really that interesting. I mean visually it's good, actors are great, some of the ideas are fine but the overall story is not really that good in my opinion and so the episode was below average in my opinion in terms of story and all these little problems which are starting to accumulate are potentially a big problem later on because I'm not sure how they will able to deal with all these issues which they've raised which might be interesting if they develop it later on it might lead to interesting stories later but it also runs the risk of completely derailing the show also in terms of continuity with the rest of the franchise and also internally and also just logically or morally and these are heavy science fiction questions. If they're going to deal with these topics, they better write it cleverly. Otherwise, it might be a disaster. So that's my opinion on this episode. Let me know what you think and we can discuss all of this in the comments below. And I will see you all next time. Bye bye.